Um, at this time, we do want to continue our worship uh, by spending a few moments in God's Word before we celebrate the, the Lord's Supper. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And also, you might be praying for Pastor Phil for his employment. <laughs> and if you know of any churches that are hiring... One of the things uh, that I really appreciated uh, about my parents, and, and uh, I'm not exactly sure where they picked this up, but growing up, uh, one of the staples in our life together as a family is we had dinner together every night. Uh, that just was the way it was. Uh, that, that just was an anchor point in our lives. We had dinner every night together as a family, and I can't even really tell you, I can't recall very many conversations around the table, I just re know that and remember that every day that was a significant part of our day, was when we gathered together for dinner, and that's when we just caught up with each other in our day, and, and uh, I'm sure that's at times that we had deeper conversations when, you know, correction or instruction needed to take place with us children, but that was just part of my life growing up, and I deeply, deeply value it because that's where we, it's one of the points at which we connected as a family. I have two sisters, as, as you may know, and my mother and father, and so that meal time was very special, and we carried that um, tradition into our own home, as many of you have. If you have not, let me, in the strongest terms possible, encourage you to establish dinner time, a meal as sacred in your home that you gather with your family every day for that time of connection and being together as a family. We still enjoy it, even though now it's, it's Kathy and, and my sister Eileen. We still enjoy having a meal together in the evening. We catch up with our days. And then we even go and, and we talk about different topics and so on and so forth. And it's just a rich time together still as a family. I encourage you to develop that as a core part of your, your family life together. As we see in the scriptures, really, you could do a study of how important mealtimes are throughout scripture because they are often connected to very significant events in the lives of God's people. God values those mealtimes because of the fe fellowship and the communion that those times afford. We think about one of the greatest celebrations in Jewish history and theology, and that's the celebration of Passover, when God delivered his people from the nation of Egypt, from slavery in Egypt, and set them free and brought them back to the promised land. How for centuries did they celebrate that stupendous, miraculous event? Through a meal. And that meal was very meaningful, and it was full of symbolism. And in fact, the last night that uh, Jesus, when he was betrayed, he and his disciples were celebrating what? The Passover meal together. And so in the midst of that, Jesus gave us instructions for what we are doing today. We call it the Lord's Supper. It has obviously changed greatly since that night that Jesus celebrated Passover with his disciples. But there is rich symbolism for us today as we come and we take bread and we take the cup, the common cup together. And this is so important that there's a portion of correction that was necessitated because of the abuse of this time in the life of the church in Corinth. And that's why I've invited you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 17. Now, as we read this passage, some of it's going to be very familiar to us. But this is also one of those passages that unfortunately has been mistaught so many times that some of us are going to find it a struggle to embrace the... Uh, the right, accurate understanding of this passage. But I hope that you will be open as we study God's word in its context to the teaching of the Holy Spirit as he enables us to understand this passage. 
So Paul begins in 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. 17, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Now, the meeting of the church in the early church, as reflected in Corinth, the meeting of the church, which took place on the first day of the week, Resurrection Sunday, on Sundays, the church would come together for a meal. It was bring your own meal, and they would come together, and each week they would celebrate the Lord's Supper. And in addition, then they would have their worship time and their instruction in the Word and prayer and, and uh, worship and singing and so on. But they came together, and they always shared a meal together. But as you can see here, in the church in Corinth, when they came together, the rich were coming with these huge overflowing picnic baskets. They were eating so much food and drinking so much alcohol that some of them were drunk. While at the same time, members of their church family who were slaves and who were poor were coming, and oftentimes they weren't able to come on time. But when they would come to the church gathering of the family... Others had already eaten. The rich had already eaten. They were already tipsy and, you know, bouncing around the, the tables and the chairs. And the poor and the slaves had virtually nothing to eat except for the little bit of crumbs that perhaps that they could gather before they came to church. And they would sit there and they would be hungry with virtually nothing to eat during the rest of the service. Do you get the picture? And Paul says... When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you're eating. Those of you that have this food and are eating ahead of the others before they get there and are overindulging yourselves, it's your meal that you're eating. You're not remembering the Lord. You're satisfying your own physical lusts and appetites. And in so doing, you are dishonoring other members of Christ's body. Now Paul goes on and he reminds them in verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So what's the purpose of the communal meal when the family comes together? When they take the common loaf of bread, what are they to be remembering? The body of the Lord Jesus Christ. When they drink from the common cup, what are they to be remembering? The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the purpose of this meal? To feed their faces or to remember the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, in remembering the Lord Jesus Christ, there are several things to remember. First of all, is his body and blood by which we are saved and we're justified. In his, to his body, our sins were poured, and he paid the penalty for all of our sin, to tell us that. And so it is by his sacrifice of his body, the shedding of his blood, that we are forgiven and we are justified before God. And that's to be remembered as they partake of the loaf and the blood. But also, by participating in communion, we are also testifying to our unity as his people. 
that we all share in the one body of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we all share in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are unified, we are connected to one another through the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in addition, we are equal. That these distinctions that they were maintaining in the Corinthian church between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, was completely anathema to remembering the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and the fact that at the cross, all are made equal. All those man-made distinctions go away at the foot of the cross where we all become followers of Jesus Christ, where we all become brothers and sisters. We become the body of Christ. Those distinctions are anathema to the Lord Jesus Christ and for the church to maintain those distinctions is to be completely out of step with the Holy Spirit and completely out of step with the meaning of the Lord's Supper. Now, in the instructions as Paul gives an application, I want you to think about, in the context, how seriously does God take this? That is, how we relate to the body of Christ, the church family, particularly in Corinth, how they were failing to recognize the relationships, the brother and sister equal relationships of one another within the body of Christ, maintaining these worldly, ungodly classes and distinctions. How serious did God take that? Look with me at verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner. Now this is where you've been mistaught. What is the unworthy manner in the context? What's the unworthy manner? Making the distinctions and dishonoring one another and not caring for one another and extending inequality and shaming the poor and not basically not loving one another within the body of Christ, but maintaining these distinctions. That's the unworthy manner. Do you see that in the context? And so when he talks about somebody taking the bread or drinking the cup in an unworthy manner, this is what he's talking about. He's not talking about us examining our whole life to make sure that there's no sin before we take communion. That's how this has been mistaught. It's been ripped out of its context. The issue is, how are we relating to one another in the body of Christ? Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, examine our attitude towards one another in the body of Christ. Then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body. Notice he doesn't say the body and the blood. So here he's talking about the body of Christ, the church. Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, that is without being sensitive to the brothers and sisters within the church family, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now how seriously does God take this? That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. How seriously does God take our attitude towards one another within our church family. For those who have, no dis, who have disregard for their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and maintain those distinctions, God takes that so seriously that he will take them home in discipline. So how seriously does God take our attitude towards one another in the body of Christ? Extremely seriously. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves, truly we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. What is Paul basically saying? Change your attitude. Change your perspective. Recognize that when you take that one loaf and you drink from that one cup, you are not only expressing your union with Christ, you are expressing your union with all your brothers and sisters who take of the same loaf and the same cup. That you are not only unified with them in Christ, but that you are equal. 
that you are equal and that all should be equally provided for. That's what love does. That's the attitude change that he was calling on at the church in Corinth. And he says in verse 33, So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. Grab, grab a half a sandwich to, you know, to take the edge off so that you can exercise some self-control when you come into the meeting of the church. And then make sure you wait for one another. And then make sure what's unspoken here is make sure that you provide. If you've got a basket overflowing and your brothers and sisters who are slaves or the poor, you make sure that you fill up their plate and their glass as full as your own. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. Now, I believe, obviously, as we now celebrate the Lord's Supper in this way, personally, I think we've lost a lot. Uh, because we don't have that meal time together to sit down and really enjoy good fellowship and good conversation with each other and to worship the Lord in that manner. And I think we've lost out. But, and so as a result, these kinds of things, we don't have a setting where this kind of abuse can be expressed, but we can still have these same kind of attitudes in our hearts. And let's pray, God, that we have a godly attitude towards one another here within the body that we say and we understand to ourselves, anybody who participates in taking this bread is my brother, my sister. Anybody who takes this cup anywhere in the world is my brother, my sister. Anybody in the world who takes this bread and this cup to remember the Lord Jesus in his death is my equal. Is my equal. And there is no distinction that we are brothers and sisters in Christ and we are equal before the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are called to love one another. And we are called to break down those classes and those distinctions that the world and the flesh and the evil one have put into place to abuse people. When we come to the table, we remember the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we're motivated then to sacrifice for one another because we're brothers and sisters and we're equal.